Let's talk a little bit about attribution. And so attribution is pretty simple. Um, it tells us where we got the information. So I need to attribute my statements in what I write and the stories that I tell so that I can tell people where I got the information. So it looks kind of like this. Jones said he found the suspect behind the house. So why do I even need to do this? Well, first of all, it establishes my credibility. It lets people know that I didn't manufacture these statements, that I actually got them from someone in authority or someone who saw it happen, somebody who was there, somebody who might know more than I do. One good thing about attribution is it puts the issue or the topic between the audience and the source. So again, you kind of step out of the way and let them build that relationship. And so it lets the audience decide whether the audience believes the source or not. So you get out of the way and put the information out there. So what do we attribute? So we attribute um, second inf information. That's something we get from somebody else. Um, criticisms, statements about controversial issues, opinions. It's really important to attribute this. Otherwise, your audience will assume and you gave them the opportunity, right, to assume that it's your opinion, it's your criticism, it's your controversial statement. So we can't do that. We need to let people know where we get everything from. And so all direct and indirect quotations, those are people's exact words or paraphrases, uh, those we're going to attribute to. Now this can be from a person or it can be from a document. It can be from an inanimate object we can get information from. So we need to tell people where that comes from. We don't need to tell people that the sun rises in the morning or anything that's an undisputed fact. For example, Tiger Stadium holds more than 100,000 people. That's a fact. We can just state it in our article, uh, in the story that we tell, and so that's not a problem. So let's look at the type of quotations that we attribute. And the partner PowerPoint to this one will go into a little bit more detail about these different kinds. So. Direct quotes are a person's exact words. Indirect quotes are actually paraphrased quotations. So this might be, uh, we might choose not to directly quote somebody for a variety of reasons. Maybe um, it's not that colorful or the person had bad grammar or didn't speak in a complete sentence. There's a lot of reasons why you would paraphrase and most of what you write is actually paraphrased. And then partial quotes, that's a word or phrase that uh, those are the exact words of the speaker. It's not a full sentence, but we would put those in quotation marks. And we need to let people know who said it. You're going to hear me talk a lot about verbs of attribution uh, because it's important to think about those. The best one and the one that you should use most often is the word said because it's neutral. It doesn't call attention to the speaker or to itself. It's kind of a wallflower verb. It doesn't um, attribute any character to the speaker. Um, so it's really good. The audience zips over it. It, it kind of falls into the background. So that's the best one. Uh, we're going to use past tense for the news stories that we write. And then when we write feature stories, we can use present tense verbs like says. Added and stated are fine if that's what's happening, uh, but you not you can't grin a word out or sigh a word out. You might uh, sigh while you're talking or chuckle while you said something, but you've got to see that you can't do that. So if a person smiles while he or she is speaking, uh, and most of the time feature story, very rarely a news story would you include that, but you can have that information. Now it's okay to have variety if it's accurate. So uh, maybe a speaker might urge his or her audience to adopt a certain attitude or idea or um, some kind of habit. Maybe um, the person's warning, uh, announcing, somebody's explaining. If the speaker's doing that, those are perfectly fine. Now let's look at punctuating a quote very briefly here. So a direct quote, you're going to use a comma to separate the quote from the attribution. And it looks like this. So notice at the end of the sentence, I don't put a period because I still have the attribution. So put a comma there. And then the official end of that sentence is going to be after the word said, after your attribution. So that's where your period is going to go. 
Often you can, for variety's sake, put your attribution in the middle of a sentence. When you do, the sentence should have a natural break. So this one does. I always run 10 miles a day, she said, and I eat 10 donuts afterward. So that's a compound sentence. That's already got a natural break. You might see a natural break uh, when you have an introductory phrase or clause, and that would work also. If you don't have a natural break, then don't put it in the middle. In fact, I would only use this style of placement for variety. And so every once in a while, you don't want to do it too much because it tends to call attention to itself. Now, if you have an indirect quote or partial quote, in most cases, you're going to punctuate that as you would a traditional sentence. So when I have the attribution first in an indirect quote, then I'm just going to leave it like that. It's pretty simple. Same thing with partial quotes. Now here are a few reminders. Place the subject's exact words in quotation marks. Don't change anything. Report the source's answers and not the questions you ask. So here's what I'm talking about. When asked if he likes donuts, Joan said, and then we go on to tell you what Joan said. Don't do this. I'm going to ban this in our class. Uh, it's kind of a lazy way to set up your statements. In most cases, you just have to say something really simple like this. Joan said he likes donuts. If you need to get us ready for that statement, then you're going to have to find a more creative way to do it because you can't use when asked. Not going to let you do it. Also, something that you will see, uh, which is not a good idea, is when you have a quotation that actually you like the quotation, but you paraphrase it in the previous sentence, and so you're repeating information. Like this, Joan said he likes donuts. I really like donuts, Joan said. Now this looks silly while I'm showing it to you, but the reason it's in here and the reason the whole when asked piece is in here is because you actually can flip the TV on, the radio, you're going to see it in print, um, I think writers, maybe sometimes we just get tired and we do these things, but we don't want to do that in our class. So here's a few more pointers. So I call, when I have a few sentences uh, of a quotation, I call that a chunk. That's not in the book, that's just my terminology. So I like donuts, Joan said, they make me happy. So that's a chunk. I only have to attribute that one time. Because what happens is that all goes together. The beginning quotation and the end quotation mark are sort of like the bows on that package. So that's a chunk. Only need to attribute it once. It could go on for four more sentences. Only need to do it once. Attribute statements only to people, documents or publications, never to places or institutions. The hospital said Smith will recover. Well, the hospital can't talk. If that happens, let me know because that's worth a story in itself, right? Uh, somebody told you that. Not a building, not an institution. Now, a floating quote is a quote that has no attribution. And when we tell a story with words in print on the web, we have to probably attribute more than we would in a video because we can actually see the person talking. So you don't have to tell us all the time who that person is. You introduced us to the person, we saw the tagline, and now we're okay. But in print, we have to do it a little bit more. So don't float the quote. So here's an example of a floating quote. So Wendy Mitchell, a sociologist, said there is a trend toward vocationalism on college campuses. And then we have a quote. Now, we assume it's Mitchell. You make us assume it's Mitchell, but don't do that. Tell us she said it. You can put... Uh, comma, after the word job, comma, Mitchell said, period. Uh, do your audience a favor and tell us who's talking. So let's look at a few more things that we want to avoid when we are using attribution. So we don't want to report a quote and then attribute it in the following paragraph. So here's an example here. Um, I was scared to death. I knew I was hurt and I needed help. These were the words today of an 18-year-old student trapped in her wrecked car. Now, what happens to your audience is it's a great quote, but we don't know who said it. 
we don't know the context of it. Um, let's go ahead and give some context to the quote first, who is the person, what's going on, and then we understand why she might have said that. And it's much, much better for your audience and also to give us a picture of the activity that's happening in the story. Now, how often do I attribute indirect quotations? So you want to attribute at least once to remind us where we are getting the information from. So, and I would say once in a paragraph. Let's make that a little bit clearer here. So we're talking about this guy, Vacante. In fact, we're going to write a story about him this week. So he said he saw the man pull a gun from his waistband and fire. The officer dropped to one knee. A reflex, he said, saved his life. So we attributed that part right at the very end where he said this reflex saved his life. That's kind of an opinion statement. Um, he's the one who thought that, so we need to make sure that he said that. Um, sometimes you have to think about whether a statement sounds like you're making it if you don't attribute it to the speaker. The Conte ducked behind the car to avoid the shot. He said the suspect had the eyes of a killer. Now, if I left out that attribution, I'd just have a sentence that says the suspect had the eyes of a killer. And the audience, rightly so, should think that I'm the one who has that opinion, when actually it's our, our subject here, Mr. Vicante, and so we, um, we weren't there to see what his eyes look like, so we need to attribute that to our interviewee. Now, if you haven't checked out the quotations PowerPoint, you want to go ahead and do that. In fact, if you have, you might want to go back and look at it now that we've talked about attribution. These two go hand in hand. They're partners in our storytelling. And it's so important to understand how to write a quotation, where to put the attribution, how to punctuate it, because we want to make sure that our mechanics don't get in the way of our incredible statements that we get from our interviewees, because that's going to be the life of your story.